Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Halloween 2, released in 1981. This was meant to be the end of Michael Myers, as written by John Carpenter and Deborah Hill, and for seven years it was, since Halloween 4 didn't come out until 1988, and Halloween 3 was, well, you know, the mask one. I'd say most horror fans consider this a solid sequel, which is a rarity in this series. It helps that director Rick Rosenthal and returning DP Dean Cundey maintained the original film's effective visual style, even as the audience got to to see much more of Michael Myers, now played by stunt performer and coordinator Dick Warlock. Different actor, but at least it's the same mask. You're gonna miss that mask later on, trust me. Halloween 2 picks up mere seconds after the original's ending, and takes place mostly in the hospital that Laurie Strode is taken to. My biggest issue with this movie is that Laurie is mostly bedbound, about as lifeless as the wig Jamie Lee Curtis is wearing since she had cut her hair short. But at least Sam Loomis is still around, even if he is already descending into crazy loose cannon territory. Gorehounds will be pleased, though, since this movie replaces the original's quiet atmospheric murders with much more graphic kills. Let's see how many there are and get to them. The movie begins with Mr. Sandman performed by the Cordettes, beginning the franchise's weird fascination with that song. Wouldn't that song be more appropriate for, like, Freddy Krueger? We actually watched the last couple of minutes of the original play out again, although new footage changes it so Loomis shoots Michael seven times and has the killer falling off the front yard balcony instead of the back. Either way, same as before, that boy be gone. Loomis loses his shit, and we get to hear the re-synthesized theme after he yells at one of the neighbors. I've been trick-or-treated to death tonight. You don't know what death is. After the opening credits, we get another first-person shot, and although it's kind of copying the original, it works because Rosenthal was trying real hard to make Halloween 2 feel like the second part to one complete movie alongside the original. Plus, we get Dr. Loomis loosening a few bolts already. I shot him six times! I shot him six times! I shot him in the heart! I shot him six times! Well, in that new clip, it was seven, but if you insist, we can call it six. First-person Michael walks through a clothesline and peeps in on an old couple, who, a frickin' course, are watching Night of the Living Dead. Get that public domain. While they're enthralled by Judith O'Day, Michael steals a kitchen knife, then overhears a breaking news broadcast talking about his deeds. Better skedaddle, my dude! He skedaddles his ass next door, where teen girl Alice Martin is basically marinated she's such dead meat. Better fire up that grill fast, cause after she sees her front door is open and dumbly approaches it without using any peripheral vision, Michael jumps up and kills her with a stab to the chest, already giving us more explicit blood than we saw in the original. Back at the Doyle house, Lori Strode is wheeled outside on a stretcher and put in an ambulance by paramedics Jimmy and Bud. They take her to Haddonfield Memorial Hospital, where the other patient of the night is a kid with a razor blade in his mouth. Oh, that is nasty, yo! I guess this came out around the time the U.S. was getting real concerned about shit like that, even though there's never been an actual recorded case of it. Lori is greeted by a skeleton crew at the hospital, led by the drunk Dr. Mixter. Janet, get me some more coffee. Despite Lori's protests, they put her to sleep with a nice needle full of drugs. Mmm. Dr. Loomis and Sheriff Brackett drive around looking for Michael, and when Loomis thinks that he sees him down the sidewalk, they pull over so the good doctor can recklessly wave his gun at this poor trick-or-treater. And then this happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, what the fuck? And you know what the best part is? Turns out that dude was Ben Tramer, the guy Lori said she liked and who Annie had set up a date with. Too bad you missed out, Lori. I bet it would have been one hot date. <laughs> oh man, that killer's crazy. Loomis is totally partially responsible for that shit. Deputy Gary Hunt shows up to tell Sheriff Brackett that Annie was found among the victims, so they all head over to the Wallace house, where a bunch of news reporters are, including one who's instructing a silent Dana Carvey, who's dressed like he's auditioning for a part in Strange Brew. Sheriff Brackett verifies it's his daughter's body, in a shot where at least Nancy Loomis got a day rate. And then Brackett decides to leave the movie entirely and pass the police role over to Deputy Hunt. Before he leaves, though, he blames Dr. Loomis while borrowing some of Donald Pleasance's acting style. You let him out! Meanwhile, Michael Myers is just walking around town, bumping into boombox blasting cowboys. Fun fact, that little cow dude is played by Lance Warlock, Dick Warlock's son. On the radio, Michael overhears that Lori was taken to Haddonfield Memorial, so that's where he's headed. He gets there in no time and is able to just walk across the grounds to enter the building because the lazy security guard Mr. Garrett isn't watching the monitor. Paramedic slash baby dear boy Jimmy pops in to check on Lori because he's nursing a little crush, but he gets shooed out of the room by head nurse Mrs. Alves. Jimmy's stoner bud Bud smokes a bud and tells him to never get involved with any patients. But Jimmy still sneaks back into Lori's room later and mentions that it was Michael Myers who attacked her. In the Myers house? That little kid who killed his sister? 
Oh yeah! Lori had no idea that it was local legend Michael frickin' Myers attacking her in the first movie. You never really think about that. But if you think that's a crazy revelation, Lori, just wait till the end of this movie. It looks like the phone line is down, so Mr. Garrett is called upon to fix it. He leaves a walkie-talkie with young nurse Janet, but fails to tell her how to use it. So, you know what? It's about to be his own damn fault when he gets killed. His inevitable demise happens after a lengthy investigation of the storeroom, when he closes a door to find Michael waiting for him with a hammer claw to the head. Very reminiscent of the sheriff's death in Friday Part 2, which came out the same year. 81. Big year for hammer claws. As the stoner stud Bud seduces another nurse, Karen, Lori lies in bed and has flashback dreams of a real Frank family conversation. I told you. I'm not your mother. She also has memories of a little boy sitting at a window who, you know, is obviously Michael Myers. It's all just setting us up for that reveal at the end of this movie that won't even be canon anymore in the new one coming out. Bud and Karen end up making out in a physical therapy hot tub when the scene gets a little hotter thanks to Michael Myers tampering with the temperature valve. Bud gets out to make things more congenial to his sperm count and, unseen by Karen as she towels herself off, is killed by Michael Myers strangling him in the background in a silent death. I guess he's getting choked with the length of some cord or something? It doesn't doesn't really matter, he did. Karen is obviously the next one to go, and it's probably the film's most memorable death, which we'll get to as soon as Karen stops caressing Michael's hand and putting his fingers in her mouth. Ah, oh, gross, Karen. That has to taste like grease and copper. After Michael is like, uh, hey, could you not? He grabs her and kills her by repeatedly dunking her head in the tub water as the temperature continues to climb. It's a real gnarly death, performed expertly by Dick Warlock and actress Pamela Shoup, and the effects are real gross, with her face skin coming off like dried Elmer's glue. When she's finally drowned, and or scalded to death, Michael unceremoniously drops her body to the floor. Also fun is the way Karen portended her own death in an earlier scene complaining about lame party activities. And bobbing for apples, actually bobbing in water, no less. The townspeople of Haddonfield are rioting at the Myers house, which Loomis explains away using ever more crazy language and tenor. The tribe, one of their number was butchered. This is the wake. Yeah. Uh, hey deputy, maybe take the gun away from the dude who sounds like he's on ayahuasca. The cops then head to an elementary school that was broken into to and find some symbolism stabbed into a desk, as well as a word written on the chalkboard that they all mispronounce. Samhain, the festival of Samhain. For the record, it's pronounced Samhain, I guess. We get another returning character from the original when Nurse Marion Chambers shows up to talk to Dr. Loomis. Oh, I didn't recognize you. Dude, she like opened the first movie with you and got her car stolen. Come on. How could you forget this chimney of a woman? She tells Loomis that the governor has ordered him back to Smith's Grove. Cause I guess by now, even Springfield knows how crazy he's become. A federal marshal escorts the doctor and nurse out of Haddonfield, with Loomis muttering about evil and shit, until Marion shuts him up by saying that they found a secret file on Michael Myers with some juicy backstory in it. That girl, that Strode girl. That's Michael Myers' sister. That's right! This is the reveal that Lori Strode was Michael's baby sister, and that after her and Mikey's parents died, she was adopted by the Strodes. Loomis yells at the marshal that Michael must be on a mission to kill his little sis now, and pulls a gun out on the officer as he orders him back to Haddonfield. What does you fellas usually do? Fire a warning shot, right? <laughs> Oh man, Loomis, you were getting so fucking arrested after all this, dude. Back at the hospital, Jimmy pays Lori another bedside visit, only to find her totally unresponsive. He calls in one last nurse I've got to introduce, Nurse Jill, who sends Nurse Janet to fetch Dr. Mixter. You know, if he's not too deep in his mixers. Turns out it's actually worse than mere inebriation, because Nurse Janet finds Mixter dead in his chair with a syringe in his eyeball. It's a fun discovery, Death, although I'm not sure what the kill specifics are. Was there a drug in that thing, or just air, or what? Janet stumbles back straight into the shape, who materializes behind her, then sticks a needle that's definitely just full of air straight into her temple, and then presses down on the plunger, killing Nurse Janet with what I guess would be an instant embolism, right? Like, you don't want air in your body where it shouldn't be, man. Oh yeah, then Michael does another head tilt. Classic. With no mixture in sight, Jimmy runs to get Nurse Alves, and Nurse Jill gets distracted by a bed buzzer from another room, allowing Michael to walk into Lori's room and start stabbing away at her bed. But turns out, it's not Lori at all under those covers. It's pillows! Yeah! Lori's finally up, and, uh, kind walking around. Sadly not for long though, since she finds a room to hunker down in and just passes out again. Damn it! Jimmy comes across head nurse Alves lying dead in an operating room, and things get kinda giallo as we see that her blood has been drained out all over the floor. After Jimmy realizes what's going on, he turns around to leave, only to slip and land on his back in the middle of this blood puddle. Bloodle? He'll be out for a while. While he takes a nap, Lori decides to give that whole consciousness thing a go again, and that's when nurse Jill runs into her in the hallway. Too bad Michael's there too. He uses a scalpel to stab nurse 
Nurse Jill in the back and murders her by lifting her body high up off the ground in a nicely done kill that echoes Bob's from the original, but with a little more panache, since the shot of her feet shows her shoes falling off. Solid kill, Michael. Way to be. It's time for Michael V. Laurie Part Duh. In another classic slasher chase scene where the killer stalks the victim at a snail's pace and the final girl runs into the corpses of previous victims, even if they're characters she's never met before. Laurie ends up on an elevator that just barely blocks Michael out, and after she reaches the ground floor, she bolts outside to the parking lot and takes shelter in the front seat of a car. After a while, Jimmy re-enters the movie when he climbs into the car and tries to start it. Laurie watches as he becomes worse than useless by passing out on the car horn and basically sending up a goddamn Michael Myers signal in the sky. This is the last we see of Jimmy, but I don't think he died, just passed out. So he doesn't go on the count. Deal with it. Laurie gets out of the car right as Loomis and co arrive, but for some reason, she's just crawling all over the ground and unable to make any noise while they're outside, only finding her voice after it's too damn late. As she makes her way to the door, Michael Myers reappears and starts walking towards her slowly, taking his time since she's locked outside and also because that's just how he be. Loomis finally lets her into the hospital, and Michael keeps stalking towards them, just walking straight through the plate glass door without nearly the speed necessary to do that. In any case, Loomis then shoots him. In fact, he shoots him five times! And that, of course, gets the shape to the ground so he can pretend to be dead for a little while. Marion Chambers heads outside to use the marshal's car radio, and while she's doing that, the marshal is real horror movie stupid and gets perfectly vulnerable around Michael, allowing the killer to rise up and kill the cop by slitting his throat with a scalpel. Man, people are dumb in this movie. Michael walks at Loomis and Lori, who run off holding hands and hide in a surgery room, where Loomis gives Lori the marshal's gun, cause you know, not like he's using it. Michael appears and just smashes straight through the door, cause I guess this hospital was built that cheap, and after Loomis's gun doesn't fire because he forgot to hit R, Michael stabs him right in the gut with a scalpel. The wounded crazy doctor falls to the floor, leaving Lori vulnerable to Michael's advances. But luckily, she has that other gun and uses it to shoot Michael in the head, actually twice for good measure. Great shots, Lori, and great shot Rick Rosenthal, of all that blood running out through the eye holes in Michael's mask. Man, I love those blood tears. Blinded, Michael starts swiping wildly at where he knows Lori to be, but Loomis gets back up and opens the valves on a tank of gas. Michael follows the noise over to him, and Lori takes the cue to start opening other tanks in the room. There's a lot of great sound design as Michael continues swiping away, and the hissing of gas grows louder as Loomis gets crazy with it. When the room is good and filled, Loomis orders Lori to run out, and tells Michael to say his prayers. It is time. Michael. With that, we get a giant hospital explosion that fills the hallway with fire. From the flames exits Michael Myers, trying one last time to keep on keeping on. In a fire stunt that was so hot, Dick Warlock got burns on his arms from the zippers on his flame suit. Thankfully, they don't put metal zippers on flame suits anymore. The heat proves to be too much for Michael, and he collapses to the ground. And although this was originally the death of both Michael and Loomis, that was retconned in Halloween 4, so nope, they don't go on the kill count. The movie ends the next morning, with just a bit more of Sheriff Brackett and Dana Carver as Lori is wheeled out to an ambulance. Michael Myers continues to burn as Mr. Sandman plays once more. You know, statistically, you are most likely to die in a hospital. How many people was that true for in Halloween 2? Let's find out and get to the numbers. 10 people died in Halloween 2, a solid doubling of Michael's first outing. The victims consisted of five guys and five girls, giving us an even 50-50 split between genders, and with a runtime of 92 minutes, we had a kill on average every 9.2 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Nurse Karen. I feel like I have to. Although there were plenty of other commendable deaths in this movie, nothing is as memorable as Karen's face peeling off as Michael dunks her over and over again. If only that hot tub were a time machine to go back to when she was still alive. Dal Machete for lamest kill will go to the marshal because it was super dumb of him to get that close to Michael, and he makes a goofy face as his throat is slit. And that's it! Halloween 2 came out in 1981 and was a success at the box office, which makes the season of the witch thing even more baffling. I'll explain next week, but until then I'm James A. Janice, this has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this week's Kill Count. I want to thank a couple of patrons like Carla Alexis, Michael Conley, Andrew Redmayne, and Logan O'Neill. While trying to come up with something to wear for this Kill Count, I remembered that I already own nurse scrubs. When I was trying to do the actor thing in LA, I was in this shitty theater production, and it cost my friends like 35 bucks to come see me. So thanks, Mark, for coming to do that. Oh man, I don't miss that shit. Thanks, y'all. Be good people.